the Reformation began as a theological dispute, but it quickly morphed into a political, a territorial, even a military one. And so it seemed obvious for a long time that one way to describe it is by using maps. Textbooks, online resources are full of maps like this one. Very useful they are too. But for today, I want you to notice an oddity. Normally, we tell students that there are two main varieties of Protestant Christianity, Lutheranism and Calvinism. The term Calvinist itself is problematic, but let's not go there today. This map, and there are many others like it, you will see shows England as something else. And it also applies this Anglicanism to the year 1555, when England had actually just been fully reconciled to, to Rome and to Catholicism. But again, let's not be picky. In fact, this is one of the more detailed maps with several minor variants represented. But if we look at broader brush definitions, depictions, we see that the, the same category, Anglican, is one of only four that makes the cut. And the choice of colour on some of these maps for this Anglicanism um, doesn't suggest that it's some kind of minor variation, but something genuinely distinct. I mean, in, in this one, the sort of imperial purple of it almost leaps off the page. And this isn't just a peculiarity of um, maps produced by English scholars for the English market. You might think that the Italians wouldn't have a, a, a dog in this fight, in these intra-Protestant definitional quarrels. Um, and it's true that the colour of England here is, is more subtly different, but the key plainly indicates that in 1598, and I want you to remember that date, um, England is majority Anglican. Even the Russians, who really are spectators in this drama, mark England out as special and describe its people as Anglicanistva. So let's be clear, this kind of thing is simply wrong. The English Reformation was not from the beginning something different from its European brethren. To use the word Anglican to describe it, at least until we get past the era of the English Civil War and the Cromwellian Republic, is, is just anachronistic and indeed actively misleading. Now, map makers tend to be conservative, but some of them are catching up with this to nail my own colours to the mast, so to speak. Um, my own recently published historical atlas of Christianity um, uses an image like this, um, in which 16th century England is in Calvinist blue, slightly mottled with Catholic pink, and there are no Anglicans in sight. Now, given that that's my view, you might think that this lecture on England's Anglican Reformation is going to be a short one. But in fact, it's the, the very fact we're dealing with a phenomenon that can't be neatly depicted on a map that I think makes this interesting. In 1991, an up and coming English church historian named Dermot McCulloch, who in the interest of full disclosure, I should say was my own doctoral supervisor a few years afterwards. Anyway, in 1991, he published an article under the teasing title, The Myth of the English Reformation. Teasing, because the title seems to suggest that the English Reformation was a myth, but the first line makes it plain. The myth of the English Reformation is that it didn't happen, or that it happened by accident rather than design, or that it was half-hearted and sought a middle way between Catholicism and Protestantism. And this myth, as he points out, isn't an abstract historical proposition, but it is a claim about the identity and nature of the institution that we call the Church of England. It's a claim that from the beginning of the English Reformation, the established Reformed Church in England had a distinctively English quality, which set it apart from its continental counterparts. And that, that was, those qualities were characterised by moderation, 
dignity, a desire to find a middle way between competing extremes. It was, in a word, Anglican. To be clear, this is indeed a myth, but like many myths, it has some foundation in fact, and it also has a stubborn persistence, which almost conjures the myth into reality. So how this turned into this in the way we tell the story, that's our subject for today. Okay, some ground clearing first. The word Anglican was not widely used to describe the distinctive Christianity of the Church of England until after the restoration of 1660, and even slowly then. The first recorded use of the word with this meaning was in, as our Italian map coincidentally guessed, 1598, and it was used by, of all people, King James VI of Scots, who five years later was going to become King of England. At this point, he was reassuring his suspicious Presbyterian subjects that although he did favour bishops in the Scottish Church, that need not mean what he called papistical or Anglican bishoping. Over the next few decades, most of the recorded uses of the A word are again by Scots, using it to refer specifically to England's bishops. The implication is that um, England's religion is a sort of decaffeinated version of Catholicism. So this is an outsider's word for the phenomenon, and it's one that doesn't really catch on. We could compare it to the way another set of outsiders spoke about the subject. That is English Catholics, who of course wanted to deny that the religion by law established in post-Reformation England truly was that of the Church of England. In 1616, an English Catholic named Thomas Harab, an exile, was trying to argue that Protestants were hopelessly divided amongst themselves. He reached for a term to distinguish England's variant, and he came up with Anglianism. And this is how he explained that neologism. He said, I call the religion of England Anglianism because it, among the rest, hath no one especial author. So not like Lutheranism or Calvinism that follow a single heretic. Instead, it's set forth by the prince and parliament. But then Harab's whole point was to argue that Protestantism was a kaleidoscope of quarrelling variety. And so he wanted to proliferate subdivisions as much as he could. For whatever reason, Anglian didn't catch on. Anglican doesn't fare much better, apart from a few Scots. Only during and after the Civil War was the word Anglican picked up south of the border, as we'll see. Before th that religion, the distinctive religion of the pre-war Church of England was, res was restored in 1660, especially before it was assaulted in 1640. It's just anachronistic to refer to Anglicanism. There was no such thing. What there was, was a Church of England, the Ecclesia Anglicana. But those terms are problematic too. Before the Reformation, the Church of England was a geographical expression, the way of referring to a portion of the universal church Catholic, which happens to be found in one income, in, in one kingdom. It was not a distinctive entity. And it's also an expression that doesn't need to be used very often. The Venerable Bede, my neighbour in Durham, had spoken of the English people as having an ecclesiastical history. But he didn't invoke Ecclesia Anglicana. The term only came into regular use from the, the 12th century onwards. In later medieval England, substantial uses of the Latin phrase and its English counterpart were commonest in two revealing contexts. The first of those is in Magna Carta whose first clause in all its variant versions is uh, opens with the stirring promise that in perpetuum quod Anglicana Ecclesia liberasit, or as the English edition of 1503 put it, perpetually 
that the Church of England be free with all its rights and liberties. The second place you find talk of the Church of England is in relation to St. Thomas Becket, who was regularly described as a martyr for the rights and liberties of the Church of England. One of the best known accounts of Becket in the late Middle Ages has him telling King Henry II that I am the head of the Church of England and am to you, Sir King, your ghostly father. What distinguishes these two cases, Magna Carta and Becket, is that they are about the church's relationship with the king. Because the king is one of the few things that, in practice, ties the two provinces of Canterbury and York together. Most of the time, despite the Archbishop of Canterbury's nebulous title of Primate of All England, the two provinces of the English church ran their own affairs. There is no such institution in the late Middle Ages as the Church of England. It was therefore of necessity a king who conjured it into a more tangible existence. At the same time as Henry VIII began to revile the Pope as merely the Bishop of Rome, he and his agents also began to talk continually of the Church of England. It was a little noticed stroke of rhetorical genius. The category was traditional, it was hard to dispute, but it immediately freighted religious questions with nationalism and with politics. The Pope's denial of Henry VIII's claims was on this reading not a dispute between the successor of St. Peter and a grasping tyrannical and adulterous layman, it was between a scheming Italian and an honest Englishman. If faced with such a choice between loyalty to the Church of England or the Church of Rome, what faithful English subject would even hesitate? Traditionalists arrested in England during the 1530s might be asked by the king's agents who they believed was the head of the Church of England. To give any other answer than the King of England, sounded not like the universal faith, but like treason. Henry, Henry VIII's regime was insisting that preachers should conform to what they called the consent and laudable custom of the Church of England. How can anyone oppose that cocktail of bland truism spiked with heresy? By the time you've pointed out that the Church of England is a geographical expression, not an entity with the capacity to consent to anything, your audience are deciding whether you're a hair-splitting pedant or a traitor. The most famous, maybe the most dangerous of all of Henry VIII's English opponents, the Yorkist prince and cardinal Reginald Poole, understood the terms that had been met, set for the debate and embraced them. He claimed boldly that if a choice had to be made, Roma est mihi patria, Rome is my country. A commendably straightforward claim, but also a propaganda gift to his enemies. Meanwhile, Henry VIII's act of supremacy, the, the legal cornerstone of his reformation, asserted that he was the supreme head at least the supreme head in earth, a perfunctory nod to the safely distant authority of Christ. The supreme head of an entity which was described awkwardly as the Church of England called Anglicana Ecclesia. That awkwardness is a sign that the ink isn't dry on this new terminology yet. But already the Church of England was becoming what it would remain, an institution whose name asserted that it comprised the whole nation, even though it didn't do so then and never has done since. Was there anything Anglican in the modern sense about these Henrician beginnings? Modern Anglicans, understandably sensitive to the jibe that their church is an accidental byproduct of a king's lusts, have generally not wanted to play up their debt to Henry VIII. But it's there. The link isn't so much to the doctrinal and ceremonial hodgepodge of Henry's church as to the rhetoric that he wove around his incoherent, 
religious settlement, a rhetoric that many of his subjects found deeply compelling and remained loyal to long after his death. Henry VIII was the true begetter of that most Anglican of ideas, the Via Media, the middle way. He constantly claimed to be trying to find a moderate path between the extremists who beset England on every side, calling each other papist and heretic, while he, their divinely appointed king, was simply trying to unite them around God's truth. In 1545, barely a year before his death, at the end of an abrasive parliamentary session, the king addressed both houses of parliament in these terms, begging them to be united in brotherly love, weeping as he made the appeal. According to our witnesses, many of the audience wept too. Say what you like about Henry VIII. He understood that monarchy is largely about theatre. And in that sense, if not in any other, he was good at his job. In fact, though, Henry's ill-defined middle way was not what we would nowadays call moderate. And not simply in the sense that anyone can make themselves moderate by choosing the right extremists to position themselves between. But nowadays, we don't normally expect moderation to be quite so ferocious. If Henry's speech to Parliament in 1545 was one face of this moderation, he'd shown another one five years earlier on the 30th of June, 1540, when he'd arranged for three papal loyalists to be hanged, drawn and quartered for treason alongside these three gents, three evangelicals who were being burned for heresy. That double-edged mass execution reminds us that moderation is a word whose meaning has shifted over the centuries. In the Tudor age, it referred to an active process, something done forcefully by one person to another. It meant something like disciplining or bridling. It's a sense which now survives chiefly in the title moderator given to certain officials. For another clue to this kind of moderation, look at the official English Bible published well, let's look at a couple of them. First of all, this, this, this first ever full English Bible published in 1535. It's adorned with a splendid title page whose series of biblical scenes laid out the evangelical reformers theological message. In pride of place there, centered in the sun, is the Hebrew name of God, the closest that Protestants would allow themselves to get to depicting the indescribable deity. And there, at the bottom, in amongst all these biblical and divine images flanked by King David on one side and St Paul on the other, as if he belongs in their company, is the King of England, with his official seal, in case you had any doubt. And you might think that that was jaw-dropping enough. And now look at the first fully official version published in 1539. Now the drama is all about the king. And in Holbein's woodcut, this is no longer a generic English king, but an unmistakably specific potato-faced individual, handing out verbum dei, the word of God, to his people. And down below, the people gratefully receive it with cries of vivat rex, and from a, 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 a couple of unlearned people in the crowd, God save the king. And in case you missed it, you're almost supposed to miss it, notice the most jaw-dropping element of all. There, squeezed in at the top, scarcely able to get a word in edgeways, is Christ himself. This is what Henry VIII meant by the moderate middle way. In the second edition of this Bible in 1540, the year of that gruesome mass execution, Archbishop Cranmer added a preface to the Bible that made the point in slightly more decorous terms. He described two parallel dangers for England's incipient reformation, that foot-dragging papists would hold it back and that over-eager zealots would race too far ahead. Keeping the country together, preferably in lockstep, was his priority. And that same principle inf informed the Book of Common Prayer, 
which is a text suffused with talk of national unity, of spurring laggards, bridling enthusiasts. In other words, as you can tell, I'm pretty wary of all this moderation talk. The person who claims to be moderate is all too often the person who is telling you to calm down and be reasonable at the same time they're up to, the, up to their elbows in your own blood. Henry VIII and even more Edward VI's regimes exuded quiet reasonableness in order to distract attention from the revolutionary change that their commissars were enforcing. But despite my wariness, I do have to admit that all this moderation was not merely smokescreen. The Reformation was genuinely pregnant with radical possibilities, which Archbishop Cranmer and his allies were determined to abort. Edward VI regime executed no Catholics for loyalty to the papacy. Actual rebels were a different matter. But it did burn two Protestant radicals for heresy. Virtually all of Edward's leading propagandists wrote works against Protestant radicalism of one kind or another. The zealots straining at the leash were sometimes useful outriders for the regime, but those who ventured too far ahead were liable to be brought back firmly into line. John Hooper, who spent the early 1540s in exile in Zurich and became one of the Edwardian Reformation's most forceful defenders, was given the strategic twin bishoprics of Worcester and Gloucester. But when he was due to be consecrated as a bishop, he refused to wear the traditional vestments. He saw them as popish rags redolent of superstition. And he was thrown into prison by the regime that had just appointed him as bishop until he reluctantly agreed to conform. Hooper would later be burned as a heretic by Queen Mary and his Victorian evangelical admirers erected a statue to him in the grounds of his old cathedral at Gloucester, a statue in which rather unfortunately he's dressed in the vestments that he so loathed. The point of this spat over vestments wasn't that Edward VI or Archbishop Cranmer or the, the, you know, those at the heart of the regime placed any particular value in vestments themselves. What they valued was discipline and unity, and they were wary of the idealists who listened to their individual consciences above the collective voice of the English church. To some extent, that's just pragmatism. But there's a more principled side to the story, too. By the mid 16th century, Europe is well on the way to this point, to being polarized into um, sharply defined Protestant and Catholic camps. But the process wasn't yet complete, and plenty of earnest and conscientious critic, uh, Christians deeply regretted it. Many still hoped to find a genuine middle way to assimilate Luther and his evangelical followers into Catholic Christendom like so many reformers had been assimilated before. The theological hero of these efforts at compromise was Martin Bucer, a Protestant reformer from Strasbourg, John Calvin's mentor, but also the great conciliator, the great believer in the power of dialogue. It never worked, but it came close. Reginald Pohl was very interested. In the 1540s, the Prince Archbishop of Cologne, Hermann von Wiet, became a hero for these idealistic centrists. He drew on Bützer and other Irenic Protestants in a doomed attempt to walk the knife edge of evangelical Catholic reform in what was a, a, a strategically pivotal diocese. Uh, but he's not alone. In the early 1550s, John Hamilton, the Archbishop of St Andrews, drew on von Viet and some of these other uh, efforts to attempt a Catholic reformation of this kind in Scotland. There were parallel efforts in Sweden, in Hungary, even in France. Archbishop Cranmer in England is very drawn by this kind of thinking. He admires von Viet, and in one of his greatest theological coups, Cranmer manages to persuade Martin Bucer himself to come to England and take up a professorship in Cambridge after war had forced him into exile. 
in the event that climate in the Fens ruined Bute's health and he died after less than two years in England, but it was a kindly thought. And the notion that England's Reformation might be muted and inclusive in its nature doesn't die with it. Under Edward VI, there were cautious voices talking of return, not to Rome, but to what loyal nostalgia had come to see as the moderate reformation of Henry VIII. People who had swallowed the old king's anti-papalism and his fastidious dislike of superstition, but were, you know, didn't want to embrace the, the, the full-throated Protestant reformation of his son. You may remember in the second lecture of this series, meeting the Kentish schoolmaster John Proctor, who coined the word deformation and openly opposed Edward the Sixth Reformation. But he also opposed what he called the Pope's false forged power. He deplored how England had in former generations been trained in worshipping stocks and stones. He celebrated the advent of the English Bible, that comfortable treasure of God's sweet word. Or, again, the distinguished Cambridge theologian John Redman, who lambasted popish superstitions, but also saw Edward VI reformers as worse than pagans and infidels. Henry VIII's Reformation might have been doctrinally incoherent, but some at least of his subjects found it appealing. Under Edward VI, these latter-day Henricians were a curiosity. Whether they were a significant voice under Mary I's Catholic Restoration is less clear. They accepted reconciliation with Rome, but in some cases apparently with a pang of regret that the moderate reformation they dreamt of was now impossible. Or at least they thought it was. It's in 1558-9 that the moment arrives for these reluctant reformers, because now they had a queen who was at least partly on their side. Elizabeth I was a Protestant, but of a distinct and rather old-fashioned kind. Idiosyncrasies on her father's scale were impossible by this time. The religious battle lines had been much too sharply drawn. But she did her best. It was unusual for a Protestant queen to dislike married clergy, to cherish choral music, and to keep a crucifix in her private chapel. Her adamantine refusal to allow further changes to her religious settlement after 1558-9 was a political decision. She was painfully conscious of the risks of alienating her more conservative subjects. She was equally aware that her Puritan subjects would take a mile if they were given an inch, and the more she was pressed to give ground, the less inclined she was to do so. But it's also a matter of personal taste. A dignified, ceremonial form of Protestantism, which liturgically celebrated the nation's unity rather than preaching up a storm of discordant opinions, that was what she liked. And because she was queen, she could and did impose that taste on the nation. Most of her subjects conformed to this settlement some contentedly, some chafing at it in some way or other. But a few began to be positive enthusiasts for it. This emerging movement, the first beginnings of what would eventually become Anglicanism, had three strands. First, there's a ritual, devotional and aesthetic strand, which has a, a sometimes playful, sometimes daring tendency to draw on the ceremonial resources of medieval Catholicism. The Puritans were wary of embracing any rites or practices that were reminiscent of the old ways, even if there was nothing inherently offensive about them. But these ceremonialists, a group whom one historian calls avant-garde conformists, they were instead eager to rescue and repurpose as much of their Catholic heritage as they could. And if upsetting the Puritans wasn't exactly the point of this effort, it was certainly an added bonus. This ceremonial strand of our movement was rooted not in England's thousands of parish churches, where the Protestant Reformation had 
had, had, had generally established itself, where organs had been dismantled and choirs disbanded and walls whitewashed. Instead, it was this ceremonialism was incubated in cathedrals and a handful of other unusual churches, places which by some quirk of their funding or patronage had held on to some of the old furnishings and patterns. Above all, that meant the weirdest church in England, Westminster Abbey, which was not an abbey anymore, but very appropriately a royal peculiar, essentially a cathedral with no bishop, a church with no parish, a free-floating ecclesiastical entity answerable only to the crown. Westminster and other places served as reservoirs in which this textured arch ceremonial form of Protestantism could persist even as it was drained out of most of the rest of England. These were places where choral music flourished. And if that music was written by crypto-Catholics like Thomas Tallis or open Catholics like William Byrd, well, so what? The Queen's insistence on the legitimacy of these practices, her stout defence of the prayer book ceremonial in particular, gave courage to those who cherished them. By the end of the century, a new generation of preachers, many of whom had come up through Westminster or the Chapel Royal, were defending these practices not just as legitimate, but as pious, enriching, edifying, certainly more so than the austerity of Calvinism, in which, in their caricature, public worship consisted of little more than interminable preaching. The prince amongst these clerics was Lancelot Andrews, the Dean of Westminster from 1601, later Bishop of Winchester. For all of the disdain for too much preaching, Andrews was by all accounts one of the finest preachers of his generation. He had a gift for finding rich layers of spiritual nourishment in traditional practice. So that's one strand. A second centred on the perennially explosive issues of jurisdiction and polity. Puritans had never liked bishops, and not only on account of the vestments that Hooper had disliked and that Andrews is proudly sporting here. The whole office of bishops smells to Puritans of popish lordliness rather than Christ-like humility and their repeated experience of Elizabethan bishops cracking down on them does not soften their views. By the 1570s, the Puritans' hopes that bishops might evolve into something more acceptable, they might be rebranded as superintendents, that's given way to blunt demands that the entire office needs to be swept away. In its place, Puritans want a more conciliar structure. The Scottish Church begins doing this in the early 1580s, replacing bishops with elected synods of ministers called presbyteries. And for many English Puritans, this becomes the great ideal to be cherished. In response to that, the establishment's defence of the status quo hardens. To begin with, the regime simply argues that episcopacy, government by bishops, is legitimate in God's eyes. But that feels like a feeble position. And soon they begin to advance positive arguments in its favour. And some even begin to argue, like Richard Bancroft, a future Archbishop of Canterbury himself, did in 1589, that episcopacy isn't merely the best structure of church government, but it's actually mandated by God's law. Christians not governed by bishops, in other words, most of the Protestant world, on this view, are missing a vital part of God's will for his church. Now, in later centuries, this was going to become an Anglican orthodoxy. But for now, it's an outlier. Richard Hooker, who is the most enduringly influential thinker in this tradition, had a more modest view of the question. Hooker spent the decade before his death in 1600 writing his vast laws of ecclesiastical polity, it's the closest thing that Anglicanism now has to a theological foundation text. And it's characteristic of what Anglicanism would become that this is not, as its title suggests, um, a book of systematic theology. It's one of law. 
and of structure. Amongst many other things, Hooker argued that episcopacy was the best possible system of church government, but not the only legitimate one. He's not willing to anathematize his bishopless brethren elsewhere in the Protestant world, although he's certainly willing to tell them that his church was better ordered than theirs. For Hooker, unlike many of his later admirers, he's still operating within a self-consciously reformed Protestant framework. He's not exactly a Calvinist. His extravagant compliments for Calvin are laced with some not very well hidden barbs. Um, but he's very much an admirer of the Reformed Church of Zurich. He insisted that Elizabeth's church stood squarely within that tradition, a tradition that the Puritans were wrongly claiming for themselves. He's Protestant, he's hierarchical, and he's proud of it. The third strand of this proto-Anglicanism is more explicitly theological. And here, here we need to talk about Reformed Protestantism's great doctrinal shibboleth, Calvinist predestination. As I mentioned in the last lecture, predestination, the doctrine that all human beings have our eternal fate, salvation or damnation, heaven or hell, decided irrevocably for us before the creation of the world. That doctrine is more or less the doctrinal consensus, consensus of the English church in the decades around 1600. But the consensus is never universal and it's never stable. That doctrine was much more appealing to 16th and 17th century Christians than it instinctively seems to us in our own age, incorrigible egotists and individualists that we are. But it's never been universally popular. Plenty of those who supported predestination disagreed over its finer points, and those disagreements kept the issue bubbling away. Theologians like William Perkins, the, the first English Protestant writer to find a truly international readership, devoted enormous efforts to resolving the pastoral problems that the doctrine of predestination caused. But no matter how subtle and humane Perkins's efforts were, they themselves testify to a persistent problem. In every country where Calvinist predestination became an orthodoxy, it also provoked opposition from within the Calvinist fold. England was, in this respect at least, at one with its sister reformed churches. What brought English anti-predestinarians out into the open, ironically enough, was the Synod of Dort, the International Calvinist Synod of 1618 to 19, in which the English fully participated and which, with the full support of the English participants, reaffirmed a stiff doctrine of predestination and stamped down a Dutch anti-predestinarian movement. It should have been a moment of Calvinist triumph, Instead, the publicity that it gave to the dispute awakened English predestinarians, as one of them put it, from a dead sleep. And it made the Synod's hardline doctrines look like a contentious and indeed a foreign partisan position rather than a settled orthodoxy. Predestination had always felt ethically counterintuitive for all the formidable theological rationale behind it. And that feeling now became the glue which brought Lancelot Andrews's ceremonialism and Richard Hooker's Episcopalianism together into a newly energized movement to celebrate the distinctive heritage of the Church of England. The fiercest partisan of the new unorthodoxy was the future Bishop Richard Montague, who in an anti-predestinarian tract from 1624, did something that no English Protestant had dared to do before. He used the notion of the English church as moderate to position itself halfway between Geneva and Rome. To most of his contemporaries, that was as shocking as claiming to position yourself halfway between good and evil. And the shock 
is part of the point. I, these, these folks are like modern cultural conservatives mischievously tweaking the nose of the politically correct establishment in the hope of the priceless endorsement of being cancelled. These proto-Anglicans are the masters of plausible deniability and of dog whistle politics, never quite saying out loud what the Puritans were sure they really meant, enjoying nothing more than making their opponents' earnest seriousness look humorless, choosing their challenges and their innovations so as to split and to wrong foot the opposition. Challenges such as, when was the Church of England founded? Staunch Protestants like John Fox, the martyrologist, were queasy about asserting any continuity between their church and the medieval church, they believed that the, the pre-Reformation church was a synagogue of Satan and that the flame of true Christianity in that era had been kept alive by a motley band of persecuted heretics and dissidents. But it's a tricky argument to make. And even if you manage to trace an unbroken chain of medieval heretics, you're left claiming some pretty iffy characters as part of the true church and also excluding some otherwise bona fide saints simply because of their loyalty to Rome. Even if that could be done, there's a more serious problem, which is the evident institutional continuity between the pre- and post-Reformation churches. The Church of England's finances, its structures, its laws, even its buildings had been updated piecemeal and partially. They weren't dismantled and refounded. The English Reformation is never a revolution. There is no year zero. Queen Elizabeth's first Archbishop of Canterbury, Matthew Parker, a staunch Protestant, but one of the Queen's own stamp, celebrated the fact that he was the 70th holder of his office, not the pioneer of a newly founded church. And if the church's own institutions couldn't let go of their medieval privileges and pedigrees. That's doubly true for the families of Welsh adventurers and Scottish princes who had declared themselves to be the Church of England's supreme heads and governors. Monarchy is, by its very nature, deeply and unavoidably invested in the notion of unbroken, centuries-long precedent. If all of those kings and queens had been mere dupes or co-conspirators of Antichrist, well, then what becomes of the ancient majesty of the English crown? Better by far to think that the medieval church was a true Christian church that had stumbled into error, but which merely needed to be reformed, not overthrown. In which case, surely parts of its heritage should be reclaimed and celebrated. Why should Rome have all the best tunes? Which is to say, it's no surprise that this whole ceremonialist pattern of thinking is particularly appealing to kings and queens and their most ardent supporters. The ceremonial revival was predominantly a movement by clergymen for clergymen, and we've been looking at a lot of glowering portraits of men in frocks, but it did win over some prominent lay people. By far the most important of them was James VI and I's surviving son, who in 15, 1625 became King Charles I. James had been intrigued by the ceremonialists. He'd made Lancelot Andrews a bishop, but he was canny enough to keep the parties balanced in his church, and no one was able to take his support for granted. Charles was entranced by the ceremonialists and untroubled by notions of political pragmatism. He became a true believer, and he packed the ceremonialists steadily onto the bishop's bench. In particular, he made the combative, committed ceremonialist William Lord, Bishop of London, and then from 1633, Archbishop of Canterbury. And historians call the 1630s the era of Lordianism. What that meant depended on who you were. 
for Lord's allies, this was a flowering of theological and liturgical creativity after the arid years of Calvinist dominance. Rich spiritual explorations within traditionalism were being undertaken by figures as diverse as John Cousin, the future Bishop of Durham, George Herbert, the pre priest poet of Wiltshire, Nicholas Ferrer, the foundation of a religious community at Little Gidding in Cambridgeshire, which had a tang of monasticism about it. The legacy of these so-called Caroline divines has been treasured within Anglicanism since, and rightly so. The other side of Lord's revolution is not so widely celebrated now. He demanded and enforced strict continuity to his new ritual norms. In particular, he overruled the common pattern whereby communion tables were brought down into the nave for communion so that people might gather around the Lord's table to share the Lord's supper. Lord insisted that they should instead be returned to the east end of church buildings like Catholic altars and set about with rails, cutting them off from the people, as in this surviving example from the 1630s from Merton in Norfolk. This sort of pattern is common in Anglican churches worldwide nowadays, but in its time, placing tables altar-wise, as they said, felt as if the Reformation itself was being undone. It's a deeply divisive symbol, railing altars like this. To its opponents, it's a symbol of clerical exclusivity and superiority. It's a turn towards superstition, which again shuts the common people out of what had briefly looked like it might become their church. Plenty of ministers, as well as lay people, bridled at the new rules, dragged their feet or actively opposed them. But neither Lord nor the King would brook resistance. The Lordian persecution of the 1630s shouldn't be overdone. I mean, if you were an anti Lordian, your career was in danger, not your life. Although there were imprisonments, and in one notorious case in 1637, three outspoken critics of the changes had their ears cut off. Even so, if this is moderation, this is a moderation of Henry VIII's kind, not the modern sort. And it might well have succeeded. A great many of the English disliked these innovations, but others supported them. There was a decade long hab habit, decades long habit of obedience. The resources of both soft and hard power standing behind the English church were formidable. But Scotland, that's another matter. Charles's northern kingdom was, in principle, a completely separate realm, which just happens to share a king with its southern neighbour. And Scotland was home both to a much more purist Calvinist church and to a much less tame political culture. Charles's father, James VI and I, had had enough experience in the rodeo of Scottish politics to have some sense of when a king could push his luck and when he should simply try to hang on. Charles who never lost his Scottish accent, nevertheless, like many long-term expats, never understood his native country as well as he thought he did. And in any case, shrewdly picking his battles was just not in his nature. Tidiness and good order were, and in this case, that meant imposing a version of the Church of England's structures, its bishops, even its Book of Common Prayer, onto Scotland. He pointedly ignored warnings and ominous rumbles about the consequence of this until the prayer book service was actually attempted in Edinburgh in 1637 with, famously, this result. Scotland erupted into open revolt, and that set in motion a chain of events which later saw Ireland rising in revolt, England descending into civil war, the victorious parliamentarians abolishing bishops and banning the Book of Common Prayer on both sides of the border, and ultimately, of course, to the parliamentary army, putting the Church of England's supreme governor on trial and cutting off his head. This catastrophe was, in fact, the making of Anglicanism. The Civil War had, in the nature of things, forced people to choose sides, and those who stood by the king needed to clarify what the religion they were defending was. 
they began to reach for that half-century-old Scots coinage dating back to King Charles's father, now revived by the king himself. Charles was, he declared, fighting for this most holy religion of the Anglican Church. One of the reasons why Charles, having been almost entirely politically isolated at the end of 1640, was able to muster enough, enough support to fight a civil war only 18 months later, was that a great many English people shared this view. They may not have identified with Archbishop Lord's full slate of changes, but they did value the Book of Common Prayer that Puritans so reviled. That book was banned by Parliament in 1645 at the, near the end of the war, but that law, like others from this chaotic period, is scarcely enforced. The bishops were deprived of office, and those who were seen as a political threat to the new regime were hunted down or driven abroad. Lord himself was beheaded. But the parliamentary and republican regimes of the 1640s and 50s are remarkably relaxed about bishops who chose to stay out of politics. Some of them remained in England and at large throughout the 1640s and 50s, operating more or less freely and ordaining enormous numbers of priests. Now, I mean, make no mistake, this era of disestablishment was certainly hard for these traditionalist prayer book Protestants. Their sufferings, their deprivations were real, but the period did give them two gifts. First of all, freedom. No longer subject to suspicious Episcopal discipline and to the straitjacket of national common prayer, they could indulge their playfulness and tendency to liturgical experiment like never before. Jeremy Taylor was a protege of Archbishop Lord, a chaplain to Charles I, but the experience of defeat converted him to the cause of religious toleration, and his devotional works like this became hugely influential, drawing on the liturgy and the deeper Catholic tradition, while remaining firmly within the Protestant camp. And alongside the freedom that came from being cast out came the gift of identity. Up till then, this kind of religion didn't have a name. It hadn't needed it. Historians have coined various awkward terms to describe it. But the point is that people at the time didn't really want one. It's just the religion of those who conform to the Church of England. But now that the established church has been taken over by Presbyterians and radicals, these folks are forced to work out who they really are. And some of them begin to use the word Anglican. And not just because of its royalist and nationalist pedigree. It's a route into the kind of piety that Jeremy Taylor is signalling in this book. Notice the way his title page claims that his prayers are according to the manner of the ancient church. Anglican covers up images of, conjures up images of the original, the ancient church of the Anglo-Saxons before popes started making overweening claims and imposing hair-splitting doctrinal tests. This is a way of answering one of the most unsettling Roman Catholic arguments against the Reformation, the charge of innovation. The question, where was your church before Luther? To claim to be defending what the royalist preacher Henry Hammond called this Anglican or rather ancient British church, a church which didn't need to look to Rome for its foundation, but could claim ancient dignity in its own right. This is a very appealing manoeuvre. So the seeds of this Anglicanism have been sown in the English Reformation from the beginning. And they had germinated periodically through the 16th and early 17th century, but always in the shade of larger and better established growths. It's the ceremonialist revival of the 1620s and 30s, immediately followed by the years of exclusion and exile in the 1640s and 50s. That's what brings it out into the open. And in that sense, we need to recognise that Anglicans are like Quakers or Baptists or Presbyterians or many others. They are simply one of the sects to emerge out of the religious crucible of the English Civil War and its aftermath. And likely that's what they'd have remained, one sect amongst many, if it hadn't been for the bizarre ending of this tale.
which is that quite suddenly and very unexpectedly, between 1658 and 1660, England's Republican governments collapsed. And finally, the exiled King Charles II was restored. And that king then re-established an entity which still called itself the Church of England. But it wasn't. It wasn't a unifying national church, a middle way holding the whole nation together with muscular moderation. It was instead a denomination. It was the Anglican church in something like the modern sense of the world, of the word. And that, despite, maybe even because of its belief that it could trace an unbroken history back to Augustine of Canterbury in the 6th century, that was something new.